We have handout notes available for you. If you haven't received a copy there on the back side of the bulletin, raise your hand and we'll have someone get a copy of that to you right away. And we have some for you at home as well there on the website. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where we will be again today. You can go ahead and find your way there. As you do so, let's pray. Lord, we want to give you thanks for your word, and we ask that you would now teach us in this subject, which is a bit, um, well, probably met with different ideas and thoughts, and uh, we just pray that either way, today you would allow your word to speak very clearly, and that you would teach us what we need to know, specifically and individually, as you know each one of us and where we are in life and in, the, in our process of walking obediently and in growing in you. And so lead us, Lord, and use your word to help purify us and uh, renew and refresh our minds. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a t-shirt that was given to me a, uh, as a gift a few years ago. And on this t-shirt, it has a group of superheroes sitting in a semicircle, all looking toward and listening intently to Jesus Christ. And there's a speech bubble above his head that says, and that's how I saved the world. And uh, maybe you've seen that before or some rendition of that. And I I, I thought, I like that. That's that's clever. So, in essence, Jesus was sharing the gospel and telling the story to top all other stories, all other superhero stories. But I thought, clever, I like it. And though I'm not an expert when it comes to knowing all about today's superheroes, I know that the group represented on the shirt were mostly the Avengers, if you're familiar with those terms. And a person might get technical and say, yeah, 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 but you can't say it's the Avengers because... There's Jesus Christ on there, and he's not technically one of the Avengers. Well, then I could say, well, let's get super technical and biblical, and I'd tell you that actually Jesus Christ is the original Avenger. 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, in fact, calls the Lord the Avenger. So no, he's not one of the Marvel superhero Avengers with a unique superpower. He is the Avenger, the original. He is not merely possessing a superpower of one sort or another. He is power. He possesses all power. He's called omnipotent. And outside of time, space, and matter, there is no enemy, whether real or imaginary, that could ever defeat him or even come close to being a challenge to him. So it's pretty exciting to know that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the Avenger. There is something exciting, satisfying, uh, emboldening about that. But it's also sobering when we understand the context in which he is called the Avenger. The context is dealing with those who are walking in sexual immorality. Whoa. Whoa. All of a sudden, that takes on a bit more of a serious note. We say, it's exciting, he's the Avenger, (laughs) until we feel, until we realize he's called that in the context of sexual immorality. We'll read the text in just a moment, but I want to remind us of the greater context of what's going on here in 1 Thessalonians. In chapters 1 through 3, Paul had been giving thanks and commending the church in Thessalonica for living the way they were supposed to live as Christians, and they were pleasing God. But rather than just saying, good, let's let adequate be sufficient, Paul tells them in chapter 4, verse 1, to excel still more. He's challenging them to take it to the next level. Just because you are doing well as a Christian, don't get content and complacent. Why don't you press on even further? You say, well, how do you do that? Paul was going to do that by giving them more explanation of the Word of God, to feed them more of the Word of God. So he goes on in from the rest, the rest of the book, 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5, to go 
uh, subject matter after subject matter where he is going to remind them of things that he's already taught them about their behavior. He will elaborate on certain things. He's going to clarify certain things. But he's going to talk about different areas of their life and their behavior to help them kind of fine-tune and take it to the next level in their behavior with the Lord. The very first subject he addresses in this list is their sexual behavior. Isn't that interesting? (laughs) Of all the things, of all the things pertaining to our daily life and behavior that could have been first on the list, he writes about our sexual behavior. You know what that indicates to us? We mentioned it last week. It indicates that how we behave sexually is very important to God. It is a very important subject. Paul didn't just try to let it get lost in the shuffle of the other subjects. He didn't just keep it for last and hopefully people would have been bored and just kind of skipped over it toward the end of the letter. No, he brings it up first and puts it in a prominent spot and devotes quite a few verses to this subject. It is something that is important. God cares how we behave sexually. We know historically the city of Thessalonica was a very immoral place, that the Christians there, having been rescued, saved out of that environment, would have still faced the daily temptations to be sexually immoral. It was part of their religious system in many ways, and so it had deep hooks in, in the lives of the believers there. And so Paul is writing to them to remind them and help them to excel in this area. This was good instruction for them. But you and I also know that we live in a very sexually immoral world, very sexually explicit. And uh, there are temptations around us all the time, and it is so easy to access. So not only is this information important for them in their day, in their culture, it is timely and it is important for you and me today. So let's go ahead and read what Paul wrote to these Christians in Thessalonica and pay close attention to the instructions he gives as to how we can excel still more when it comes to our sexual morality, starting in verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So in this passage, there are at least five bold instructions for us to understand and apply if we want to excel not only just in life in general as Christians, but more specifically excel in our sexual purity, in our sexual morality. We've examined the first two of these five so far, just a brief review of those. We learned in verse 3 that we need to be sexually set apart. He uses the term sanctification three times in the text, and it simply means to be set apart. Not Not to be set apart from sexual behavior, that's not what he's saying, but to be set apart and to abstain from sexual immorality. And to understand what immorality is, We went ahead and looked, biblically speaking, at what morality is. What is sexual morality? And it's very clear in Scripture that God created man and woman and marriage and the sexual relationship. He not only created it, He commanded it, and He did all of that before creation week was even done. Before God would rest on day seven. Before God would even give the prohibition against eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He gave these other designs, capacities, and the command. But we must understand that he also confines it to the marriage relationship. Anything outside of that is immorality. 
understanding the moral standard is just very helpful because then you don't have to produce the long list of every, every possible thing that would be considered immoral. If it's between the husband and the wife alone within the boundary of marriage, a biblical marriage, which is the union between a biological man and a biological woman, if, if it's in there, then that is morality, and there's no restriction. Everything outside of that is considered immorality, and Paul says if we want to excel in our sexual purity, then we need to be set apart from the world's sinful spin and all of the immorality that's out there. God has created the original. God has created what is good and holy and right. But you have to know, and we do know, that Satan and humanity and rebellion against God has imagined and created every, every form of perversion of what God has provided. And uh, though it varies from person to person, we see in our text every person has some form of lustful passion for something immoral. And there is that temptation to allow that passion to control us, to do what is immoral. So we learned a second truth last time in verses 4 and 5. In order to excel in this area, we need to be self-controlled. Just because we desire to do something doesn't mean we should do it. If it is outside of the boundary of what God says is right and moral and good, our responsibility is self-control doesn't matter what you desire. Sometimes the things that you desire will flat out shock you and say, how dare I have even such a strange thought as that. It doesn't matter whether you desire something that someone else doesn't understand or whether their desire is, is gross to you or it doesn't matter if it is a perversion of what is holy. We are not to go there and our responsibility is to be self-controlled. We need to not let our lustful passions control us we must learn to possess or control our bodies. The unsaved world out there, um, they don't know God. They don't care about God's standards. They don't know God's standards. Um, so that's their excuse. They will be held accountable for it. They're not off the hook. But they live the way they live because they don't know any better. But you and I cannot take that same excuse, for we know God and we know His standards. And um, therefore, we must exercise self-control, possess our bodies in sanctification. He's called us to be set apart from the sinful behavior. He's called us to use our bodies in honorable ways. So those are two very important uh, truths, instructions, and you can go back and listen to those messages if you need uh, more detail there. Those should be on our, our channel. But thirdly, let's press on into the final instructions. To excel in our sexual purity, we need to be staying in bounds. Staying in bounds. Paul says that in being sexually immoral, what do we do? We are transgressing and defrauding our brother. We transgress and defraud others. This word transgress has the idea of stepping across a boundary line. Isn't that interesting? Stepping across the boundary, like trespass. <laughs> You're trespassing. God has clearly given a boundary, hasn't he? We've studied that. But when we leave that boundary that God has established, the boundary of marriage, we're not only sinning against God to our own harm, we are also transgressing and defrauding others to their harm. Sexual sin always hurts other people. It doesn't matter how private you think that it's, it is. It will always result in some form of damage to others. When a person is sexually active outside of the boundary of marriage, they are very literally messing around with someone else's private property. You're transgressing, crossing a boundary line, therefore you're trespassing. <laughs> trespassing. If that person is not your spouse, that person's not your property. That's not your, uh, it's not for you. And you do not belong to them. Therefore, 
Not only are you sinning against the one that you are being sexual with, even if they're consenting, it's still sinning against them. You're also defrauding the one that they belong to or that they will eventually belong to if it's before either are married. So when someone sins in this way, it usually generates a deep hurt and a deep, deep anger in an, in an individual, the one that's sinned against. And vengeance or revenge is often desired. We're told in Romans chapter 12, among other places in Scripture, that vengeance belongs to the Lord, that it does not belong to us. And so a person may feel a bit robbed in that. They say, uh, my spouse had an affair and I am angry and I, des I desire to act in revenge, but I can't because God says that vengeance is His. Well, that deep hurt that is caused, that does bring up that desire for revenge, the Lord understands that. And no, vengeance is not for you and for me, but even in this text, we're reminded that Jesus Christ actually steps into the picture to help take care of the problem, to help deal with the problem. The Lord is the avenger. So biblically, the Lord reserves the right for vengeance in all situations, but he doesn't go through in every single sin that is presented in Scripture and say, yes, but I'm the avenger here, and I'm the avenger here, and I'm the avenger here. We just know vengeance is the Lord's. But in this case, specifically in the realm of sexual immorality, the emphasis is placed because of the deep hurts that it can cause for those who feel that they've been hurt so deeply. They're reminded that Jesus Christ, the Lord, He steps in and He is alerted when this takes place. Um, someone might say, man, that just seems a bit extreme. I mean, why emphasize it here in this, in this one sexual sin, this, this one type of sin, in sexual immorality? Why is it such a big deal? Isn't that kind of behavior just a natural function of the body? Isn't it just for procreation or just for fun? Why does God care so much about the proper usage of our sexuality? Understanding God's purpose for the sexual relationship, why he created it, helps us understand why it's such a big deal when it is misused. Let's talk about only two of the purposes for why God created the sexual relationship. There are more than these, but when we see the reason why, these two reasons, we see why when it is used improperly, it causes a lot of problems. First of all, and we know this, of course, it's for procreation. But God doesn't want reproduction just for the sake of more people on the planet. We learn in the book of Malachi that God desires a godly offspring, and He created the family unit specifically to allow children to be brought up and reared in a healthy home environment with committed parents, a father and a mother that are joined in marriage. Bringing children into this world without a stable family uh, without a stable family relationship just because someone wants to go and be active in that regard and a, uh, a baby is created in that moment, that's not God's ideal design. God can overcome that and God can still allow children to enter into functional families and God can even rescue in His grace one who is um, in a single home. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of tragedy can happen and God can redeem and and uh, rescue and all of that, but it's not part of his ideal design. Therefore, if it a side effect of the sexual relationship is procreation, is a baby that needs to be brought up in a family unit with a committed father and mother joined in marriage. Another purpose is for the provision of oneness. The provision of oneness. Why did God create the sexual relationship? It's to provide a oneness, a bond, a special oneness in a relationship. Genesis 2.24, we've seen this verse in this context earlier last week and the week before. He says that the two, 
the husband and wife shall become one flesh. We know that that's referring to the sexual relationship, but notice how even the way that he describes it talks about how it is a unifying thing. It's to unify the two partners. It's interesting. God created it. God commands it. God encourages it between the husband and the wife. But isn't it all, I don't know if you've ever just thought about it, practically speaking, why did God make that then intriguing to people or desirable or pleasing to people? Um, couldn't it have just been that he made it neutral? Hey, it's time to have a baby, and God says, this is what you do. Okay, well, then let's do this so we can have a baby. Otherwise, eh. You say, well, that is, that is my opinion of it. Well, <laughs> that may be, and it may be that you are very unique in this world, but we know that the world knows the reality because the world says, I want to sell this bag of chips. How are we going to sell this bag of chips to people? I know. Let's make it sexual. Then everybody will watch the commercial and everybody will want the bag of chips. You're like, what does the bag of chips have to do with anything sexually? Nothing. But they know that they can sell it to you through the means of sex. We know that, that it is something that is desirable, that is intriguing, something that people want. Why did God design it that way? Couldn't he just made it, make it indifferent? Could it possibly be that God made it pleasing and desirable because of a positive side effect? Not just children, but another side effect. One of the biggest positive side effects is the bond that it creates between the two partners who are supposed to be husband and wife. Because he created it to help reinforce and strengthen the relationship, he encourages that activity between a husband and a wife. It's not that God is like, look, you just need to not unless you want to have a baby. We see plenty, plenty of references uh, in Scripture, in Proverbs and in Song of Songs that have absolutely nothing to do with procreation but God blessing that relationship. He encourages it because of the side effect of creating a bond and a oneness that is reinforced. Because of this incredible power for good, that's also why it is such an incredible problem when it is misused. Because it creates bonds where they shouldn't be and creates incredible amounts of damage. When applied outside of a marriage relationship, it generates a bond to someone with whom there is no commitment, unconditional commitment of marriage. And it hurts people, the transgression and defrauding of the one that is supposed to be bonded with that individual. This type of transgression in life hurts more deeply than most any other type of transgression you can commit against another. There is something, something deeply betraying and hurtful. This bond of the sexual relationship has been illustrated well by, of all things, duct tape. Um, duct tape, we know, has an incredibly sticky bond. And uh, you take a piece of duct tape and if you stick it to uh, a surface, it's, it's stuck there. And that is going to be its greatest bond of its existence. Now, you can take that piece of duct tape and you can rip it off of that surface and break that bond. Sometimes you'll destroy the duct tape or destroy the other substance. But even if you don't, you can go and you can apply it to another surface. That second application is still going to be kind of strong, but it's not going to be like the first application. The tape is becoming less effective. You can rip it off of that surface and go apply it to another surface and so on and so forth and each time it is ripped off and applied to a different surface it becomes less effective, less sticky. The bond becomes weaker and it becomes nothing more than just a piece of material. If you can imagine 
a man and a woman who are keeping themselves pure for the marriage. And the first application of that bond is to one another, and they keep it there. Consider the incredible strength of that bond. You ever taken two pieces of duct tape and stuck them together, sticky side together? Not usually on purpose. Some, usually is when you're, you know, pulling multiple pieces of tape and you have a project and they stick together and you're like, okay, well, there's no way those two are coming apart. And if you try to rip them apart, what happens? You destroy both pieces of tape. Um, you really can't remove or break apart what has been joined together in that regard. And so I think it's a good illustration. I think it, it, it was a good illustration that uh, someone has come up with that, you know, that is exactly like how God creates the sexual relationship. And even as it says in Genesis 2.24, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall be joined or cleave to, to his wife, and the two shall become one. There's definitely the idea of bonding and unity. Because God has made the sexual relationship to be so powerful. And as a special unifying bonding agent to the husband and the wife, he doesn't take it lightly when it's misused. Not only because it's disobedience to him, but also because of the deep hurt and brokenness that it causes to others. Granted, sexual sins may be more exciting and enticing than other sins, but they're also more betraying and hurtful and damaging. Therefore, God doesn't take it lightly. Paul reminds us of the cost of transgressing another or of trespassing on someone else's private property. When we do that, the avenger takes notice. And if there's one person you don't want on your tail avenging someone that you have hurt in a very profoundly deep way, it's the Lord Jesus. You say, well, that's strange. The Lord Jesus, the avenger. I always want to be close to him. What, him on your tail? Like, what are you even saying? Well, it says here that he becomes the avenger. There is something that can be deeply satisfying to one who has been hurt through someone else's immoral activity to say, I don't even know what to do, I'm so hurt. But to know that the Lord Jesus knows and that he gets involved to do what is right and do what is fair. Paul says, therefore, that he has solemnly warned them about this. This is a solemn warning when you get the attention of the avenger. But you say, yeah, 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 but Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He took my punishment so that I don't have to face the punishment of my sins. Um, true. Like, theologically speaking, true. Very true. But if you use that to justify ongoing sexual immorality, to say, yeah, but Jesus, Jesus took the beating for that. Like, I can continue on in this because I know that I am forgiven and I will continue to be forgiven. Well, the, the answer is, yes, God forgives anything and everything and even when we stumble again and when we stumble again. But if we have that as our attitude, when we want to take advantage of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness and say, I'll just persist in this because God will forgive me. I'll still go to heaven. You need to understand that there is severe discipline, corrective discipline in line. God the Father does not want His children to act in such a way. And if we say, but I'll just be forgiven, I'm forgiven anyway. The father steps in with some severe corrective discipline. Please understand this. God absolutely forgives the sin, but he doesn't change the consequences. He absolutely forgives the sin, but he doesn't change the consequences. The consequences are something that a person may have to live with for the rest of their life. Even though we're free from the punishment of that sin, 
there are still natural consequences that can last a lifetime. And from the human vantage point, even seeing the difference between what punishment looks like, divine punishment and divine discipline, can be very hard to distinguish. That's why Paul says, I solemnly warned you about this. Who's he writing to? Christians. He's writing to Christians. You can't say that the avenger will not mess with me because I'm a Christian. He's writing to Christians saying, watch out. I solemnly warn you. You step across certain boundary lines, the harm and damage that you do through that, it alerts the avenger. Well, if we want to excel in our sexual purity, uh, we definitely need to stay in bounds. A fourth instruction here, moving on to verses 7 and 8 briefly. We must be submissive to God. In all this discussion, we can ask the question again, who, whose will, whose commands are being presented here in this text. It's God's. Verse 3, God's will for us is sexual sanctification. It's God's will. Uh, We see as well in verse 7 that it's God's call in our lives to be experientially sanctified. In other words, our behavior. We, We use our body in sanctification and in honor. And in verse 8, Paul tells us that if you're rejecting these teachings, you're not rejecting man. These are not my teachings. These are not Paul's teachings. These are God's teachings, he says. So this is, in reality, a, a, a situation or a subject matter that relates to our submission and obedience to God. More so than it is to our parents. If you're still living under your parents' roof and they have lame rules, you know, this is not so much about submission to your parents, though it's there. Uh, This is not so much about submission to your church or to your Christian friends. This is submission ultimately to God. Yes, your parents, your church family, your Christian friends are to be there to help keep us accountable. They are to set boundaries, but more important than being obedient to them and walking in fellowship with them, this is a matter of obedience to and walking in fellowship with God. So to excel in this area of our life, we need to understand this is a matter of obedience or disobedience to God. This is not about a church rules or house rules or my Christian friends rules. This is about God's standards. And finally, and um, fifth in verse 8, the final instruction Paul gives here, if we are to excel in spiritual, sexual purity, we need to be strengthened by the Spirit. One may say that God has called us to an impossible task. How can God ask for sexual sanctification or morality, knowing that we live in such a sexually immoral world. He's setting us up for an impossible task. Well, remember two things. First, He has provided a safe and healthy environment in which to carry out those desires. Technically, He's not depriving or prohibiting us from that kind of activity. But he has provided a safe, healthy environment in which he encourages us to carry out those desires without restrictions, and that's within the marriage relationship. So, exercise self-control until you can enter into a biblical marriage and then absolutely enjoy and satisfy those desires. He's not depriving anyone. He's not prohibiting He has created that for the purpose of helping bond a marriage, so use it for that purpose. He's only prohibiting the misuse of it, and therefore the dangerous and uh, destructive application of it. Secondly, He has provided the strength for us to walk in obedience through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
that he has given to us. He's provided the strength. Notice Paul says at the end of verse 8, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. That not only is meant to remind us how, how important it is that we use our bodies in a way that's honoring to God because the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. But he's also reminding us that you actually have the divine power of the Holy Spirit of God living in your body to help give you the strength to resist temptation and stay walking the way that we should walk. One final point in our notes. God does not call us to do something that he doesn't also empower us to do. He doesn't call us to do something that He doesn't also empower us to do. If He calls you to do it, He will give you the tools, the equipment, the strength to carry it out. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, Paul will tell the Thessalonians, Faithful is He who calls you, who will also bring it to pass. We learned in our text today that God has called us for the purpose of sanctification and honor, sexually speaking. If that's what God's calling is, He is also faithful to help bring it to pass. Now, if you say, well, I don't want to walk in obedience in this way. I want to do what my body wants to do. Well, He's not going to force this. But if you come at this humbly and you say to God, you've called me to this, to to purity, I deeply want to walk in purity. Faithful is He. He'll be there to help bring that to pass. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. (laughs) Being completely aware of our capacity to sin and our desire to do things that are outside of God's boundaries and God's will, God instructs us then to walk by the Spirit. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires, the sinful desires of the flesh. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? It means to depend upon the Holy Spirit for every step, every moment we experience in life. Just like a person with an injured leg that is prone to fall depends upon crutches to move throughout life, every step, every moment, so we who are prone to stumble and fall must lean fully, entirely, on the Holy Spirit every step that we take, every moment we experience in life. And though the flesh always wants to take us on the wrong path, the Holy Spirit will keep us on the right path as we depend upon Him. I realize that this is a quite the subject for us to consider in a setting such as this. Um, Sex is always awkward to talk about, especially in a church setting. Um, The most embarrassing slip-ups you can make is uh, when you're talking about something and something sexual uh, happens. I was praying once at a, um, you're like, ooh, really? I, I did slip up once. I was praying at a, uh, a, um, a vows renewal ceremony. A couple had been married for probably 30 years or so. And um, as I was praying for them at the conclusion of the ceremony, the benediction prayer, I was praying that the Lord would grant them great sex, uh, success, success <laughs> in the next years of their marriage. And um, talk about uncomfortable and embarrassing. And I can just imagine what was going through everybody's mind. I'm sure the guy, the man renewing the vows was like, oh yes, Lord, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. The, the wife was probably like, how much did he pay you to pray <laughs> like that? I'm sure the men in the, uh, in the audience were like, oh, lucky, that guy's so lucky. The pastor's <laughs> praying about that. The wives are probably like, eh. and Livy is probably like, Mike, what are you doing, you weirdo? What, why are you... But these subjects are often met with differing levels of embarrassment or concern. And again, for some of us in here, we say, no, this is a love 
covering a subject like this, especially in a church setting, because I know what God calls us to, and I know what kind of world we live in, and I know the kind of pressures that we face. I need all the help and encouragement and instruction I can get. The people in Thessalonica were struggling with this, and Paul's solution was, let me tell you a bit more about this, and so he writes about it. It's important for us if we want to excel in this area. Some of us say, I want to excel. I've been walking in purity, and I want to excel. Or I stumbled in the past, but I'm walking in purity, and I want to excel. And you say, this is a great subject. For others, you might be facing just this overwhelming weight of heavy conviction in your life. You're like, I almost can't tolerate this subject in a church setting because I just feel the crushing weight of conviction. I've done things in my life where I have gotten the attention of the avenger, you say. I've done some things that I realize I have hurt some people more profoundly and deeply than I'll ever know. I've taken some things from people that they will never get back. And you say it's almost too heavy and oppressive. If you feel that, that weight, uh, you do need to understand that that is the loving discipline of God at work in your life, helping you understand how serious it is to Him, helping you understand that He calls for and desires our purity. He's trying to lead us to confess, confession and repentance. Look, He already knows the details of what has been done. But he desires that we confess that, admit those things to him, and that we repent, that we change our mind about our way, and we change the direction that we walk in this life in that regard. You need to understand that though it is a heavy deal, God does, God can, and he does forgive. If you're contrite, if you're broken, if you're humble, if you come to him in confession and repentance, God absolutely will forgive. He can forgive that sin as easily as any other sin or as difficultly as any other sin. It's all forgivable. Are there consequences? Absolutely, absolutely. But you can at least be back in close fellowship with God as you walk throughout life, you can enjoy the blessings of His grace. Today is Communion Sunday. A great, a great subject matter to consider in light of a Communion Sunday because uh, it's very difficult to walk in perfect, per perfect um, purity in this regard, day in and day out. And we realize for so many who have failed in this regard that Jesus Christ did take the punishment. Yes, he's the avenger. He will come to the aid of those who have been afflicted and, and uh, tra transgressed and exploited in this. He will come to your aid. But not for the wrath against a believer. Discipline, yes. Wrath, the wrath of God was satisfied by Jesus Christ on the cross. All the sins that we've committed, not just in this area, but in every area. Last week we looked in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and there was a list of sexual immorality style sins, but then there were other sins that we would say, well, those are lightweight sins, but they were all lumped into one list. Jesus Christ's death on the cross satisfied God's wrath in light of all of those sins. And so today we get the opportunity, the great blessing of remembering what Jesus did that allows us to be forgiven and have a relationship with God. I'll uh, invite the music team up as we prepare for the communion service. What is it that Jesus did? Well, in us having all be be guilty of sin, all of us being guilty of sin. Jesus Christ came and uh, was our substitute. When he hung on the cross, he was dying to take the punishment of our sin. 
He was paying the price that our sin cost. And so when we take communion, uh, when we take the bread, we remember his body that received the punishment for our sins. And when we take the cup, we remember the blood that was shed so that we can be forgiven. Um, are you going to pass the elements or have them on the tables? On the tables. And so as we've been doing, we'll, we're going to continue to do again today, but the elements are going to be on two tables just inside these center doors here. And we're going to take a moment and sing and have some time of reflection where we can evaluate our lives. In 1 Corinthians 11, we're told to first examine ourselves before taking communion. And if there's some unconfessed sin, confess that to the Lord just between you and Him. Uh, but we're going to dismiss row by row, starting in the front. You'll go out the sides and then come in and grab a stack of two cups. One has the bread and one has the juice, and then you can make your way back to your seat. And hold on to those, um, the elements, and we will take those together. But we're going to sing a song that reminds us of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And uh, it also has some opportunities at the, at, toward the end of the song, once we've taken communion, to sing in uh, response to Jesus' victory and being able to sing hallelujah to him. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer, and then we will dismiss you all for getting the elements. Let's pray. Lord, we do want to give you thanks for this subject that we've been able to discuss, a, a very interesting subject in a church setting, but what better place to hear about it than from your word, as you are the creator and designer. We pray that you would give us the strength to walk in purity, and for those who may need to come into line and walk in purity, that you would draw them near to you, that, their, that your kindness and goodness would bring them near to you. And we thank you that all things that we do in this life have been paid for by Jesus Christ's death on the cross. And as we remember his sacrifice, we remember also the forgiveness provided therein. Well, we learn in 1 John 1, 9 that you, if we, are, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we hold on to that promise. We claim that promise today. But help us not to take it lightly, for we know, Jesus, it cost you your life. So we remember you in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll go ahead and dismiss those front rows.